Chapter 13 Patterns of Inheritance Concept Outline Section 13.1 Mendel Solved the Mystery of Heredity Early Ideas About Heredity, The Road to Mendel Before Mendel, the mechanism of inheritance was not known. Mendel and the Garden Pea Mendel experimented with heredity and edible peas counted his results. What Mendel found Mendel found that alternative traits for a character segregated among second-generation progeny in the ratio 3 to 1. Mendel proposed that information for a trait rather than the trait itself is inherited. How Mendel interpreted his results Mendel found that one alternative of a character could mask the other in heterozygotes, but both could subsequently be expressed in homozygotes of future generations. Mendelian inheritance is not always easy to analyze. A variety of factors can influence the Mendelian segregation of alleles. Section 13.2 Human genetics follows Mendelian principles. Most gene disorders are rare. Tay-Sachs disease is due to a recessive allele. Multiple alleles, the ABO blood groups. The human ABO blood groups are determined by three I gene alleles. Patterns of inheritance can be deduced from pedigrees. Hemophilia is sex-linked. Gene disorders can be due to simple alterations of proteins. Sickle cell anemia is caused by a single amino acid change. Some defects may soon be curable. Cystic fibrosis may soon be cured by gene replacement therapy. Section 13.3 Genes are on chromosomes. Chromosomes, the vehicles of Mendelian inheritance. Mendelian segregation reflects the random assortment of chromosomes in meiosis. Genetic recombination. Crossover frequency reflect the physical distance between genes. Human chromosomes. Humans possess 23 pairs of chromosomes, one of them determining the sex. Human abnormalities due to alterations in chromosome number. Loss or addition of chromosomes has serious consequences. Genetic counseling. Some gene defects can be detected early in pregnancy. Every living creature is a product of the long evolutionary history of life on Earth. While all organisms share this history, only humans wonder about the processes that led to their origin. We are still far from understanding everything about our origins, but we have learned a great deal. Like a partially completed jigsaw puzzle, the boundaries have fallen into place, and much of the internal structure is becoming apparent. In this chapter, we will discuss one piece of the puzzle, the enigma of heredity. Why do groups of people from different parts of the world often differ in appearance? Figure 13.1 Why do the members of a family tend to resemble one another more than they resemble members of other families? Section 13.1 Mendel solved the mystery of heredity. Early ideas about heredity, the road to Mendel. As far back as written records go, patterns of resemblance among the members of particular families have been noted and commented on. Figure 13.2. Some familial features are unusual, such as the protruding lower lip of the European royal family Habsburg, evident in pictures and descriptions of family members from the 13th century onward. Other characteristics, like the occurrence of red headed children within families of red headed parents, are more common. Figure 13.3. Inherited features, the building blocks of evolution, will be our concern in this chapter. Classical Assumption 1, Constancy of Species 2 concepts provided the basis for most of the thinking about heredity before the 20th century. The first is that heredity occurs within species. For a very long time people believed that it was possible to obtain bizarre composite animals by breeding, crossing, widely different species. The Minotaur of Cretan mythology, a creature with the body of a bull and the torso and head of a man, is one example. The giraffe was thought to be another, its scientific name, Giraffa camelopardalis, suggests the belief that it was the result of a cross between a camel and a leopard. From the Middle Ages onward, however, people discovered that such extreme crosses were not possible and that variation and heredity occur mainly within the boundaries of a particular species. 
species were thought to have been maintained without significant change from the time of their creation. Classical Assumption 2, Direct Transmission of Traits The second early concept related to heredity is that traits are transmitted directly. When variation is inherited by offspring from their parents, what is transmitted? The ancient Greeks suggested that the parents' body parts were transmitted directly to their offspring. Hippocrates called this type of reproductive material gonos, meaning seed. Hence, a characteristic such as a misshapen limb was the result of material that came from the misshapen limb of a parent. Information from each part of the body was supposedly passed along independently of the information from the other parts, and the child was formed after the hereditary material from all parts of the parents' bodies had come together. This idea was predominant until fairly recently. For example, in 1868, Charles Darwin proposed that all cells and tissues excrete microscopic granules, or gemmules, that are passed to offspring, guiding the growth of the corresponding part in the developing embryo. Most similar theories of the direct transmission of hereditary material assumed that the male and female contributions blend in the offspring. Thus, parents with red and brown hair would produce children with reddish-brown hair, and tall and short parents would produce children of intermediate height. Kohlruder demonstrates hybridization between species. Taken together, however, these two concepts lead to a paradox. If no variation enters a species from outside, and if the variation within each species blends in every generation, then all members of a species should soon have the same appearance. Obviously, this does not happen. Individuals within most species differ widely from each other, and they differ in characteristics that are transmitted from generation to generation. How could this paradox be resolved? Actually, the resolution had been provided long before Darwin, in the work of the German botanist Joseph Kohlruder. In 1760, Kohlruder carried out successful hybridizations of plant species, crossing different strains of tobacco and obtaining fertile offspring. The hybrids differed in appearance from both parent strains. When individuals within the hybrid generation were crossed, their offspring were highly variable. Some of these offspring resembled plants of the hybrid generation, their parents, but a few resembled the original strains, their grandparents. The classical assumptions fail. Kohlruder's work represents the beginning of modern genetics, the first clues pointing to the modern theory of heredity. Kohlruder's experiments provided an important clue about how heredity works, the traits he was studying could be masked in one generation, only to reappear in the next. This pattern contradicts the theory of direct transmission. How could a trait that is transmitted directly disappear and then reappear? Nor were the traits of Kohlruder's plants blended. A contemporary account stated that the traits reappeared in the third generation, fully restored to all their original powers and properties. It is worth repeating that the offspring in Kohlruder's crosses were not identical to one another. Some resembled the hybrid generation, while others did not. The alternative forms of the characters Kohlruder was studying were distributed among the offspring. Referring to a heritable feature as a character, a modern geneticist would say the alternative forms of each character were segregating among the progeny of a mating, meaning that some offspring exhibited one alternative form of a character, for example, hairy leaves, while other offspring from the same mating exhibited a different alternative, smooth leaves. This segregation of alternative forms of a character, or traits, provided the clue that led Gregor Mendel to his understanding of the nature of heredity. Knight studies heredity in peas. Over the next hundred years, other investigators elaborated on Kohlruder's work. Prominent among them were English gentlemen farmers trying to improve varieties of agricultural plants. In one such series of experiments, carried out in the 1790s, T.A. Knight crossed two true breeding varieties, varieties that remain uniform from one generation to the next, of the garden pea, Pisum sativum, figure 13.4. One of these varieties had purple flowers, and the other had white flowers. All of the progeny of the cross had purple flowers. Among the offspring of these hybrids, however, were some plants with purple flowers and others, less common, with white flowers. 
Just as in Kohlreuter's earlier studies, a trait from one of the parents disappeared in one generation only to reappear in the next. In these deceptively simple results were the makings of a scientific revolution. Nevertheless, another century passed before the process of gene segregation was fully appreciated. Why did it take so long? One reason was that early workers did not quantify their results. A numerical record of results proved to be crucial to understanding the process. Knight and later experimenters who carried out other crosses with pea plants noted that some traits had a stronger tendency to appear than others, but they did not record the numbers of the different classes of progeny. Science was young then, and it was not obvious that the numbers were important. Synopsis Early geneticists demonstrated that some forms of an inherited character, one, can disappear in one generation only to reappear unchanged in future generations, two, segregate among the offspring of a cross, and, three, are more likely to be represented than their alternatives. Mendel and the Garden P. The first quantitative studies of inheritance were carried out by Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk, figure 13.5. Born in 1822 to peasant parents, Mendel was educated in a monastery and went on to study science and mathematics at the University of Vienna, where he failed his examinations for a teaching certificate. He returned to the monastery and spent the rest of his life there, eventually becoming abbot. In the garden of the monastery, figure 13.6, Mendel initiated a series of experiments on plant hybridization. The results of these experiments would ultimately change our views of heredity irrevocably. Why Mendel chose the garden pea? For his experiments, Mendel chose the garden pea, the same plant Knight and many others had studied earlier. The choice was a good one for several reasons. First, many earlier investigators had produced hybrid peas by crossing different varieties. Mendel knew that he could expect to observe segregation of traits among the offspring. Second, a large number of true breeding varieties of peas were available. Mendel initially examined 32. Then, for further study, he selected lines that differed with respect to seven easily distinguishable traits, such as round versus wrinkled seeds and purple versus white flowers, a character that Knight had studied. Third, pea plants are small and easy to grow, and they have a relatively short generation time. Thus, one can conduct experiments involving numerous plants, grow several generations in a single year, and obtain results relatively quickly. A fourth advantage of studying peas is that the sexual organs of the pea are enclosed within the flower, figure 13.7. The flowers of peas, like those of many flowering plants, contain both male and female sex organs. Furthermore, the gametes produced by the male and female parts of the same flower, unlike those of many flowering plants, can fuse to form viable offspring. Fertilization takes place automatically within an individual flower if it is not disturbed, resulting in offspring that are the progeny from a single individual. Therefore, one can either let individual flowers engage in self-fertilization, or remove the flower's male parts before fertilization and introduce pollen from a strain with a different trait, thus performing cross-pollination which results in cross-fertilization. Mendel's Experimental Design Mendel was careful to focus on only a few specific differences between the plants he was using and to ignore the countless other differences he must have seen. He also had the insight to realize that the differences he selected to analyze must be comparable. For example, he appreciated that trying to study the inheritance of round seeds versus tall height would be useless. Mendel usually conducted his experiments in three stages. One, first, he allowed pea plants of a given variety to produce progeny by self-fertilization for several generations. Mendel thus was able to assure himself that the traits he was studying were indeed constant, transmitted unchanged from generation to generation. Pea plants with white flowers, for example, when crossed with each other, produced only offspring with white flowers, regardless of the number of generations. Two, Mendel then performed crosses between varieties exhibiting alternative forms of characters. For example, he removed the male parts from the flower of a plant that produced white flowers and fertilized it with pollen from a purple-flowered plant. He also carried out the reciprocal cross, 
using pollen from a white-flowered individual to fertilize a flower on a pea plant that produced purple flowers, figure 13.8. 3. Finally, Mendel permitted the hybrid offspring produced by these crosses to self-pollinate for several generations. By doing so, he allowed the alternative forms of a character to segregate among the progeny. This was the same experimental design that Knight and others had used much earlier. But Mendel went an important step farther, he counted the numbers of offspring exhibiting each trait in each succeeding generation. No one had ever done that before. The quantitative results Mendel obtained proved to be of supreme importance in revealing the process of heredity. Synopsis Mendel's experiments with the garden pea involved crosses between true breeding varieties, followed by a generation or more of inbreeding. What Mendel found The seven characters Mendel studied in his experiments possessed several variants that differed from one another in ways that were easy to recognize and score, figure 13.9. We will examine in detail Mendel's crosses with flower color. His experiments with other characters were similar, and they produced similar results. The F1 generation. When Mendel crossed two contrasting varieties of peas, such as white flowered and purple flowered plants, the hybrid offspring he obtained did not have flowers of intermediate color, as the theory of blending inheritance would predict. Instead, in every case, the flower color of the offspring resembled one of their parents. It is customary to refer to these offspring as the first filial. Filius is Latin for, son, or F1, generation. Thus, in a cross of white-flowered with purple-flowered plants, the F1 offspring all had purple flowers, just as Knight and others had reported earlier. Mendel referred to the trait expressed in the F1 plants as dominant and to the alternative form that was not expressed in the F1 plants as recessive. For each of the seven pairs of contrasting traits that Mendel examined, one of the pair proved to be dominant and the other recessive. The F2 generation. After allowing individual F1 plants to mature and self-pollinate, Mendel collected and planted the seeds from each plant to see what the offspring in the second filial, or F2, generation would look like. He found, just as Knight had earlier, that some F2 plants exhibited white flowers, the recessive trait. Hidden in the F1 generation, the recessive form reappeared among some F2 individuals. Believing the proportions of the F2 types would provide some clue about the mechanism of heredity, Mendel counted the numbers of each type among the F2 progeny, figure 13.10. In the cross between the purple-flowered F1 plants, he counted a total of 929 F2 individuals, see figure 13.9. Of these, 705, 75.9%, had purple flowers and 224, 24.1%, had white flowers. Approximately one quarter of the F2 individuals exhibited the recessive form of the character. Mendel obtained the same numerical result with the other six characters he examined, three quarters of the F2 individuals exhibited the dominant trait, and one quarter displayed the recessive trait. In other words, the dominant, recessive ratio among the F2 plants was always close to 3 to 1. Mendel carried out similar experiments with other traits, such as wrinkled versus round seeds, figure 13.11, and obtained the same result. A disguised 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Mendel went on to examine how the F2 plants pass traits on to subsequent generations. He found that the recessive one quarter were always true breeding. In the cross of white-flowered with purple-flowered plants, for example, the white-flowered F2 individuals reliably produced white-flowered offspring when they were allowed to self-fertilize. By contrast, only one-third of the dominant purple-flowered F2 individuals, one-quarter of all F2 offspring, proved true breeding, while two-thirds were not. This last class of plants produced dominant and recessive individuals in the third filial, F3, generation in a 3 to 1 ratio. This result suggested that, for the entire sample, the 3 to 1 ratio that Mendel observed in the F2 generation was really a disguised 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, one quarter pure breeding dominant individuals, one half not pure breeding dominant individuals, and one quarter pure breeding recessive individuals, figure 13.12. Mendel's model of heredity. 
From his experiments, Mendel was able to understand four things about the nature of heredity. First, the plants he crossed did not produce progeny of intermediate appearance, as a theory of blending inheritance would have predicted. Instead, different plants inherited each alternative intact, as a discrete characteristic that either was or was not visible in a particular generation. Second, Mendel learned that for each pair of alternative forms of a character, one alternative was not expressed in the F1 hybrids, although it reappeared in some F2 individuals. The trait that disappeared must therefore be latent, present but not expressed, in the F1 individuals. Third, the pairs of alternative traits examined segregated among the progeny of a particular cross, some individuals exhibiting one trait, some the other. Fourth, these alternative traits were expressed in the F2 generation in the ratio of three-quarters dominant to one-quarter recessive. This characteristic three-to-one segregation is often referred to as the Mendelian ratio. To explain these results, Mendel proposed a simple model. It has become one of the most famous models in the history of science, containing simple assumptions and making clear predictions. The model has five elements. 1. Parents do not transmit physiological traits directly to their offspring. Rather, they transmit discrete information about the traits, what Mendel called factors. These factors later act in the offspring to produce the trait. In modern terms, we would say that information about the alternative forms of characters that an individual expresses is encoded by the factors that it receives from its parents. 2. Each individual receives two factors that may code for the same trait or for two alternative traits for a character. We now know that there are two factors for each character present in each individual because these factors are carried on chromosomes, and each adult individual is diploid. When the individual forms gametes, eggs or sperm, they contain only one of each kind of chromosome, see chapter 12, the gametes are haploid. Therefore, only one factor for each character of the adult organism is contained in the gamete. Which of the two factors ends up in a particular gamete is randomly determined. 3. Not all copies of a factor are identical. In modern terms, the alternative forms of a factor, leading to alternative forms of a character, are called alleles. When two haploid gametes containing exactly the same allele of a factor fuse during fertilization to form a zygote, the offspring that develops from that zygote is said to be homozygous. When the two haploid gametes contain different alleles, the individual offspring is heterozygous. In modern terminology, Mendel's factors are called genes. We now know that each gene is composed of a particular DNA nucleotide sequence, see Chapter 3. The particular location of a gene on a chromosome is referred to as the gene's locus, plural, loci. 4. The two alleles, one contributed by the male gamete and one by the female, do not influence each other in any way. In the cells that develop within the new individual, these alleles remain discrete. They neither blend with nor alter each other. Mendel referred to them as uncontaminated. Thus, when the individual matures and produces its own gametes, the alleles for each gene segregate randomly into these gametes, as described in element 2. 5. The presence of a particular allele does not ensure that the trait encoded by it will be expressed in an individual carrying that allele. In heterozygous individuals, only one allele, the dominant one, is expressed, while the other, recessive, allele is present but unexpressed. To distinguish between the presence of an allele and its expression, modern geneticists refer to the totality of alleles that an individual contains as the individual's genotype and to the physical appearance of that individual as its phenotype. The phenotype of an individual is the observable outward manifestation of its genotype, the result of the functioning of the enzymes and proteins encoded by the genes it carries. In other words, the genotype is the blueprint, and the phenotype is the visible outcome. These five elements, taken together, constitute Mendel's model of the hereditary process. Many traits in humans also exhibit dominant or recessive inheritance, similar to the traits Mendel studied in Peas, Table 13.1. Synopsis When Mendel crossed two contrasting varieties, he found all of the offspring in the first generation exhibited one, dominant, 
trait, and none exhibited the other, recessive, trait. In the following generation, 25% were pure breeding for the dominant trait, 50% were hybrid for the two traits and exhibited the dominant trait, and 25% were pure breeding for the recessive trait. How Mendel interpreted his results. Does Mendel's model predict the results he actually obtained? To test his model, Mendel first expressed it in terms of a simple set of symbols, and then used the symbols to interpret his results. It is very instructive to do the same. Consider again Mendel's cross of purple flowered with white flowered plants. We will assign the symbol big P to the dominant allele, associated with the production of purple flowers, and the symbol little p to the recessive allele, associated with the production of white flowers. By convention, genetic traits are usually assigned a letter symbol referring to their more common forms, in this case, p for purple flower color. The dominant allele is written in uppercase, as big P, the recessive allele, white flower color, is assigned the same symbol in lowercase, little p. In this system, the genotype of an individual that is true breeding for the recessive white flower trait would be designated little p little p. In such an individual, both copies of the allele specify the white flowered phenotype. Similarly, the genotype of a true breeding purple flowered individual would be designated big p big p, and a heterozygote would be designated big p little p, dominant allele first. Using these conventions, and denoting a cross between two strains with cross, we can symbolize Mendel's original cross as little p little p cross big p big p. The F1 generation. Using these simple symbols, we can now go back and re-examine the crosses Mendel carried out. Because a white-flowered parent, little p little p, can produce only little p gametes, and a pure purple-flowered, homozygous dominant, parent, big p big p, can produce only big p gametes, the union of an egg and a sperm from these parents can produce only heterozygous big p little p offspring in the F1 generation. Because the big p allele is dominant, all of these F1 individuals are expected to have purple flowers. The little p allele is present in these heterozygous individuals, but it is not phenotypically expressed. This is the basis for the latency Mendel saw in recessive traits. The F2 generation. When F1 individuals are allowed to self-fertilize, the big P and little p alleles segregate randomly during gamete formation. Their subsequent union at fertilization to form F2 individuals is also random, not being influenced by which alternative alleles the individual gametes carry. What will the F2 individuals look like? The possibilities may be visualized in a simple diagram called a Punnett square, named after its originator, the English geneticist Reginald Crundall Punnett, figure 13.13. .13. Mendel's model, analyzed in terms of a Punnett square, clearly predicts that the F2 generation should consist of three-quarters purple-flowered plants and one-quarter white-flowered plants, a phenotypic ratio of 3 to 1, figure 13.14. The laws of probability can predict Mendel's results. A different way to express Mendel's result is to say that there are three chances in four, three quarters, that any particular F2 individual will exhibit the dominant trait, and one chance in four, one quarter, that an F2 individual will express the recessive trait. Stating the results in terms of probabilities allows simple predictions to be made about the outcomes of crosses. If both F1 parents are big P little p, heterozygotes, the probability that a particular F2 individual will be little p little p, homozygous recessive, is the probability of receiving a little p gamete from the male, one half, times the probability of receiving a little p gamete from the female, one half, or one quarter. This is the same operation we perform in the Punnett square illustrated in figure 13.13. The ways probability theory can be used to analyze Mendel's results is discussed in detail on page 251. Further generations. As you can see in figure 13.14, there are really three kinds of F2 individuals, one quarter are pure breeding, white flowered individuals, little p little p, one half are heterozygous, purple flowered individuals, big p little p, and one quarter are pure breeding, purple flowered individuals, Big P Big P. 
The 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio is really a disguised 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. Mendel's first law of heredity, segregation. Mendel's model thus accounts in a neat and satisfying way for the segregation ratios he observed. Its central assumption, that alternative alleles of a character segregate from each other in heterozygous individuals and remain distinct, has since been verified in many other organisms. It is commonly referred to as Mendel's first law of heredity, or the law of segregation. As you saw in Chapter 12, the segregational behavior of alternative alleles has a simple physical basis, the alignment of chromosomes at random on the metaphase plate during meiosis 1. It is a tribute to the intellect of Mendel's analysis that he arrived at the correct scheme with no knowledge of the cellular mechanisms of inheritance, neither chromosomes nor meiosis had yet been described. The Test Cross To test his model further, Mendel devised a simple and powerful procedure called the Test Cross. Consider a purple flowered plant. It is impossible to tell whether such a plant is homozygous or heterozygous simply by looking at its phenotype. To learn its genotype, you must cross it with some other plant. What kind of cross would provide the answer? If you cross it with a homozygous dominant individual, all of the progeny will show the dominant phenotype whether the test plant is homozygous or heterozygous. It is also difficult, but not impossible, to distinguish between the two possible test plant genotypes by crossing with a heterozygous individual. However, if you cross the test plant with a homozygous recessive individual, the two possible test plant genotypes will give totally different results, figure 13.15. Alternative 1, unknown individual homozygous dominant, big P big P. Big P big P cross little P little P, all offspring have purple flowers, big P little P. Alternative 2, unknown individual heterozygous, big P little P. Big P little P cross little P little P, one half of offspring have white flowers, little P little P, and one half have purple flowers, big P little P. To perform his test cross, Mendel crossed heterozygous F1 individuals back to the parent homozygous for the recessive trait. He predicted that the dominant and recessive traits would appear in a 1 to 1 ratio, and that is what he observed. For each pair of alleles he investigated, Mendel observed phenotypic F2 ratios of 3 to 1, see figure 13.14, and test cross ratios very close to 1 to 1, just as his model predicted. Test crosses can also be used to determine the genotype of an individual when two genes are involved. Mendel carried out many two gene crosses, some of which we will discuss. He often used test crosses to verify the genotypes of particular dominant appearing F2 individuals. Thus, an F2 individual showing both dominant traits, big A underscore big B underscore, might have any of the following genotypes, big A big A big B big B, big A little A big B big B, big A big A big B little B, or big A little A big B little B. By crossing dominant appearing F2 individuals with homozygous recessive individuals, that is, big A underscore big B underscore cross little A little A little B little B, Mendel was able to determine if either or both of the traits bred true among the progeny, and so to determine the genotype of the F2 parent. Big A big A big B big B, both trait big A breeds true and trait big B breeds true. Big A little A big B big B, only trait big B breeds true. Big A big A big B little B, only trait big A breeds true. Big A little A big B little B, neither trait breeds true. Mendel's Second Law of Heredity, Independent Assortment After Mendel had demonstrated that different traits of a given character, alleles of a given gene, segregate independently of each other in crosses, he asked whether different genes also segregate independently. Mendel set out to answer this question in a straightforward way. He first established a series of pure breeding lines of peas that differed in just two of the seven characters he had studied. He then crossed contrasting pairs of the pure breeding lines to create heterozygotes. In a cross involving different seed shape alleles, round, big R, and wrinkled, little r, and different seed color alleles, yellow, big Y, and green, little y, all the F1 individuals were identical, each one heterozygous for both seed shape, big r little r, and seed color, 
big Y little Y. The F1 individuals of such a cross are dihybrids, individuals heterozygous for both genes. The third step in Mendel's analysis was to allow the dihybrids to self-fertilize. If the alleles affecting seed shape and seed color were segregating independently, then the probability that a particular pair of seed shape alleles would occur together with a particular pair of seed color alleles would be simply the product of the individual probabilities that each pair would occur separately. Thus, the probability that an individual with wrinkled green seeds, little r little r little y little y, would appear in the F2 generation would be equal to the probability of observing an individual with wrinkled seeds, one quarter, times the probability of observing one with green seeds, one quarter, or one sixteenth. Because the gene controlling seed shape and the gene controlling seed color are each represented by a pair of alternative alleles in the dihybrid individuals, for types of gametes are expected, big R big Y, big R little Y, little R big Y, and little R little Y. Therefore, in the F2 generation there are 16 possible combinations of alleles, each of them equally probable, figure 13.16. Of these, nine possess at least one dominant allele for each gene, signified big R underscore big Y underscore, where the dash indicates the presence of either allele, and, thus, should have round, yellow seeds. Of the rest, three possess at least one dominant R allele but are homozygous recessive for color, big R underscore little Y little Y, three others possess at least one dominant big Y allele but are homozygous recessive for shape, little r little r big y underscore, and one combination among the 16 is homozygous recessive for both genes, little r little r little y little y. The hypothesis that color and shape genes assort independently thus predicts that the F2 generation will display a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio, 9 individuals with round, yellow seeds, 3 with round, green seeds, 3 with wrinkled, yellow seeds, and 1 with wrinkled, green seeds, see figure 13.16. What did Mendel actually observe? From a total of 556 seeds from dihybrid plants he had allowed to self-fertilize, he observed, 315 round yellow, big R underscore big Y underscore, 108 round green, big R underscore little Y little Y, 101 wrinkled yellow, little R little R big Y underscore, and 32 wrinkled green little r little r little y little y. These results are very close to a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, which would be 313 to 104 to 104 to 35. Consequently, the two genes appeared to assort completely independently of each other. Note that this independent assortment of different genes in no way alters the independent segregation of individual pairs of alleles. Round versus wrinkled seeds occur in a ratio of approximately 3 to 1, for 23 to 133, so do yellow versus green seeds, for 16 to 140. Mendel obtained similar results for other pairs of traits. Mendel's discovery is often referred to as Mendel's second law of heredity, or the law of independent assortment. Genes that assort independently of one another, like the seven genes Mendel studied, usually do so because they are located on different chromosomes, which segregate independently during the meiotic process of gamete formation. A modern restatement of Mendel's second law would be that genes that are located on different chromosomes assort independently during meiosis. Synopsis Mendel summed up his discoveries about heredity in two laws. Mendel's first law of heredity states that alternative alleles of a trait segregate independently, his second law of heredity states that genes located on different chromosomes assort independently. Mendelian inheritance is not always easy to analyze. Although Mendel's results did not receive much notice during his lifetime, three different investigators independently rediscovered his pioneering paper in 1900, 16 years after his death. They came across it while searching the literature in preparation for publishing their own findings, which closely resembled those Mendel had presented more than three decades earlier. In the decades following the rediscovery of Mendel, many investigators set out to test Mendel's ideas. However, scientists attempting to confirm Mendel's theory often had trouble obtaining the same simple ratios he had reported. Often, the expression of the genotype is not straightforward. 
Most phenotypes reflect the action of many genes that act sequentially or jointly, and the phenotype can be affected by alleles that lack complete dominance and the environment. Continuous variation. Few phenotypes are the result of the action of only one gene. Instead, most characters reflect the action of polygenes, many genes that act sequentially or jointly. When multiple genes act jointly to influence a character such as height or weight, the character often shows a range of small differences. Because all of the genes that play a role in determining phenotypes such as height or weight segregate independently of one another, one sees a gradation in the degree of difference when many individuals are examined, figure 13.17. We call this gradation continuous variation. The greater the number of genes that influence a character, the more continuous the expected distribution of the versions of that character. How can one describe the variation in a character such as the height of the individuals in figure 13.17? Individuals range from quite short to very tall, with average heights more common than either extreme. What one often does is to group the variation into categories, in this case, by measuring the heights of the individuals in inches, rounding fractions of an inch to the nearest whole number. Each height, in inches, is a separate phenotypic category. Plotting the numbers in each height category produces a histogram, such as that in figure 13.17. The histogram approximates an idealized bell-shaped curve, and the variation can be characterized by the mean and spread of that curve. Pleiotropic effects. Often, an individual allele will have more than one effect on the phenotype. Such an allele is said to be pleiotropic. When the pioneering French geneticist Lucien Cunot studied yellow fur in mice, a dominant trait, he was unable to obtain a true breeding yellow strain by crossing individual yellow mice with each other. Individuals homozygous for the yellow allele died, because the yellow allele was pleiotropic, one effect was yellow coat color but another was a lethal developmental defect. A pleiotropic allele may be dominant with respect to one phenotypic consequence, yellow fur, and recessive with respect to another, lethal developmental defect. In pleiotropy, one gene affects many traits, in marked contrast to polygyny, where many genes affect one trait. Pleiotropic effects are difficult to predict, because the genes that affect a trait often perform other functions we may know nothing about. Pleiotropic effects are characteristic of many inherited disorders, such as cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia, both discussed later in this chapter. In these disorders, multiple symptoms can be traced back to a single gene defect. In cystic fibrosis, patients exhibit clogged blood vessels, overly sticky mucus, salty sweat, liver and pancreas failure, and a battery of other symptoms. All are pleiotropic effects of a single defect mutation in a gene that encodes a chloride ion transmembrane channel. In sickle cell anemia, a defect in the oxygen-carrying hemoglobin molecule causes anemia, heart failure, increased susceptibility to pneumonia, kidney failure, enlargement of the spleen, and many other symptoms. It is usually difficult to deduce the nature of the primary defect from the range of a gene's pleiotropic effects. Lack of complete dominance. Not all alternative alleles are fully dominant or fully recessive in heterozygotes. Some pairs of alleles instead produce a heterozygous phenotype that is either intermediate between those of the parents, incomplete dominance, or representative of both parental phenotypes, codominance. For example, in the cross of red and white flowering Japanese for o'clocks described in figure 13.18, all the F1 offspring had pink flowers, indicating that neither red nor white flower color was dominant. Does this example of incomplete dominance argue that Mendel was wrong? Not at all. When two of the F1 pink flowers were crossed, they produced red, pink, and white flowered plants in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Heterozygotes are simply intermediate in color. Environmental effects. The degree to which an allele is expressed may depend on the environment. Some alleles are heat sensitive, for example. Traits influenced by such alleles are more sensitive to temperature or light than are the products of other alleles. The Arctic foxes in figure 13.19, for example, make fur pigment only when the weather is warm. Similarly, 
the CH allele in Himalayan rabbits and Siamese cats encodes a heat-sensitive version of tyrosinase, one of the enzymes mediating the production of melanin, a dark pigment. The CH version of the enzyme is inactivated at temperatures above about 33 degrees Celsius. At the surface of the body and head, the temperature is above 33 degrees Celsius and the tyrosinase enzyme is inactive, while it is more active at body extremities such as the tips of the ears and tail, where the temperature is below 33 degrees Celsius. The dark melanin pigment this enzyme produces causes the ears, snout, feet, and tail of Himalayan rabbits and Siamese cats to be black. Epistasis In the tests of Mendel's ideas that followed the rediscovery of his work, scientists had trouble obtaining Mendel's simple ratios particularly with the hybrid crosses. Recall that when individuals heterozygous for two different genes mate, a dihybrid cross, for different phenotypes are possible among the progeny, offspring may display the dominant phenotype for both genes, either one of the genes, or for neither gene. Sometimes, however, it is not possible for an investigator to identify successfully each of the four phenotypic classes, because two or more of the classes look alike. Such situations proved confusing to investigators following Mendel. One example of such difficulty in identification is seen in the analysis of particular varieties of corn, Z maize. Some commercial varieties exhibit a purple pigment called anthocyanin in their seed coats, while others do not. In 1918, geneticist R. A. Emerson crossed two pure breeding corn varieties, neither exhibiting anthocyanin pigment. Surprisingly, all of the F1 plants produced purple seeds. When two of these pigment-producing F1 plants were crossed to produce an F2 generation, 56% were pigment producers and 44% were not. What was happening? Emerson correctly deduced that two genes were involved in producing pigment, and that the second cross had thus been a dihybrid cross. Mendel had predicted 16 equally possible ways gametes could combine. How many of these were in each of the two types Emerson obtained? He multiplied the fraction that were pigment producers, 0.56, by 16 to obtain 9, and multiplied the fraction that were not, 0.44, by 16 to obtain 7. Thus, Emerson had a modified ratio of 9 to 7 instead of the usual 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Why was Emerson's ratio modified? When genes act sequentially, as in a biochemical pathway, an allele expressed as a defective enzyme early in the pathway blocks the flow of material through the rest of the pathway. This makes it impossible to judge whether the later steps of the pathway are functioning properly. Such gene interaction, where one gene can interfere with the expression of another gene, is the basis of the phenomenon called epistasis. The pigment anthocyanin is the product of a two-step biochemical pathway. Starting molecule, colorless, by way of enzyme 1 produces intermediate, colorless, which by way of enzyme 2 produces anthocyanin, purple. To produce pigment, a plant must possess at least one functional copy of each enzyme gene, figure 13.20. The dominant alleles encode functional enzymes, but the recessive alleles encode non-functional enzymes. Of the 16 genotypes predicted by random assortment, nine contain at least one dominant allele of both genes, they produce purple progeny. The remaining seven genotypes lack dominant alleles at either or both loci, 3 plus 3 plus 1 is equal to 7, and so are phenotypically the same, non-pigmented, giving the phenotypic ratio of 9 to 7 that Emerson observed. The inability to see the effect of enzyme 2 when enzyme 1 is non-functional is an example of epistasis. Other examples of epistasis. In many animals, coat color is the result of epistatic interactions among genes. Coat color in Labrador retrievers, a breed of dog, is due primarily to the interaction of two genes. The big E gene determines if dark pigment, eumelanin, will be deposited in the fur or not. If a dog has the genotype little e little e, no pigment will be deposited in the fur, and it will be yellow. If a dog has the genotype big E big E or big E little E, big E underscore, pigment will be deposited in the fur. A second gene, the big B gene, determines how dark the pigment will be. 
this gene controls the distribution of melanosomes in a hair. Dogs with the genotype Big E underscore Little B Little B will have brown fur and are called chocolate labs. Dogs with the genotype Big E underscore Big B underscore will have black fur. But, even in yellow dogs, the Big B gene does have some effect. Yellow dogs with the genotype Little E Little E Little B Little B will have brown pigment on their nose, lips, and eye rims, while yellow dogs with the genotype little e little e big b underscore will have black pigment in these areas. The interaction among these alleles is illustrated in figure 13.21. The genes for coat color in this breed have been found, and a genetic test is available to determine the coat colors in a litter of puppies. Synopsis A variety of factors can disguise the Mendelian segregation of alleles. Among them are the continuous variation that results when many genes contribute to a trait, incomplete dominance and codominance that produce heterozygotes unlike either parent, environmental influences on the expression of phenotypes, and gene interactions that produce epistasis. Probability and allele distribution Many, although not all, alternative alleles produce discreetly different phenotypes. Mendel's pea plants were tall or dwarf, had purple or white flowers, and produced round or wrinkled seeds. The eye color of a fruit fly may be red or white, and the skin color of a human may be pigmented or albino. When only two alternative alleles exist for a given character, the distribution of phenotypes among the offspring of a cross is referred to as a binomial distribution. As an example, consider the distribution of sexes in humans. Imagine that a couple has chosen to have three children. How likely is it that two of the children will be boys and one will be a girl? The frequency of any particular possibility is referred to as its probability of occurrence. Let P symbolize the probability of having a boy at any given birth and Q symbolize the probability of having a girl. Since any birth is equally likely to produce a girl or boy, P equals Q equals one half. Table 13a shows eight possible gender combinations among the three children. The sum of the probabilities of the eight possible combinations must equal 1. Thus, p cubed plus 3p squared q plus 3pq squared plus q cubed equals 1. The probability that the three children will be two boys and one girl is 3p squared q equals 3 times 1 half squared times 1 half equals 3 eighths. To test your understanding, try to estimate the probability that two parents heterozygous for the recessive allele producing albinism, little a, will have one albino child in a family of three. First, set up a Punnett square. You can see that one-fourth of the children are expected to be albino, little a, little a. Thus, for any given birth the probability of an albino child is one-quarter. This probability can be symbolized by Q. The probability of a non-albino child is three-quarters, symbolized by P. Therefore, the probability that there will be one albino child among the three children is 3P squared Q equals three times, three-quarters, squared times, one-quarter, equals 27 sixty-fourths, or 42%. This means that the chance of having one albino child in the three is 42%. Vocabulary of genetics. Allele. One of two or more alternative forms of a gene. Diploid. Having two sets of chromosomes, which are referred to as homologs. Animals and plants are diploid in the dominant phase of their life cycles as are some protists. Dominant allele. An allele that dictates the appearance of heterozygotes. One allele is said to be dominant over another if a heterozygous individual with one copy of that allele has the same appearance as a homozygous individual with two copies of it. Gene. The basic unit of heredity, a sequence of DNA nucleotides on a chromosome that encodes a polypeptide or RNA molecule and so determines the nature of an individual's inherited traits. Genotype. The total set of genes present in the cells of an organism. This term is often also used to refer to the set of alleles at a single gene. Haploid. Having only one set of chromosomes. Gametes, certain animals, 
protists, and fungi, and certain stages in the life cycle of plants are haploid. Heterozygote A diploid individual carrying two different alleles of a gene on two homologous chromosomes. Most human beings are heterozygous for many genes. Homozygote A diploid individual carrying identical alleles of a gene on both homologous chromosomes. Locus The location of a gene on a chromosome. Phenotype The realized expression of the genotype, the observable manifestation of a trait, affecting an individual structure, physiology, or behavior, that results from the biological activity of the DNA molecules. Recessive allele An allele whose phenotypic effect is masked in heterozygotes by the presence of a dominant allele. Section 13.2 Human genetics follows Mendelian principles. Random changes in genes, called mutations, occur in any population. These changes rarely improve the functioning of the proteins those genes encode, just as randomly changing a wire in a computer rarely improves the computer's functioning. Mutant alleles are usually recessive to other alleles. When two seemingly normal individuals who are heterozygous for such an allele produce offspring homozygous for the allele, the offspring suffer the detrimental effects of the mutant allele. When a detrimental allele occurs at a significant frequency in a population, the harmful effect it produces is called a gene disorder. Most gene disorders are rare. Tay-Sachs disease is an incurable hereditary disorder in which the nervous system deteriorates. Affected children appear normal at birth and usually do not develop symptoms until about the eighth month, when signs of mental deterioration appear. The children are blind within a year after birth, and they rarely live past five years of age. Tay-Sachs disease is rare in most human populations, occurring in only one of 300,000 births in the United States. However, the disease has a high incidence among Jews of Eastern and Central Europe, Ashkenazi, and among American Jews, 90% of whom trace their ancestry to Eastern and Central Europe. In these populations, it is estimated that 1 in 28 individuals is a heterozygous carrier of the disease, and approximately 1 in 3,500 infants has the disease. Because the disease is caused by a recessive allele, most of the people who carry the defective allele do not themselves develop symptoms of the disease. The Tay-Sachs allele produces the disease by encoding a non-functional form of the enzyme hexosaminidase A. This enzyme breaks down gangliosides, a class of lipids occurring within the lysosomes of brain cells, figure 13.22. As a result, the lysosomes fill with gangliosides, swell, and eventually burst, releasing oxidative enzymes that kill the cells. There is no known cure for this disorder. Not all gene defects are recessive. Not all hereditary disorders are recessive. Huntington's disease is a hereditary condition caused by a dominant allele that leads to the progressive deterioration of brain cells, figure 13.23. Perhaps 1 in 24,000 individuals develops the disorder. Because the allele is dominant, every individual that carries the allele expresses the disorder. Nevertheless, the disorder persists in human populations because its symptoms usually do not develop until the affected individuals are more than 30 years old, and by that time most of those individuals have already had children. Consequently, the allele is often transmitted before the lethal condition develops. A person who is heterozygous for Huntington's disease has a 50% chance of passing the disease to his or her children, even though the other parent does not have the disorder. In contrast, the carrier of a recessive disorder such as cystic fibrosis has a 50% chance of passing the allele to offspring and must mate with another carrier to risk bearing a child with the disease. Synopsis Most gene defects are rare recessives, although some are dominant. Multiple alleles, the ABO blood groups. A gene may have more than two alleles in a population, and most genes possess several different alleles. Often, no single allele is dominant, instead, each allele has its own effect, and the alleles are considered codominant. A human gene with more than one codominant allele is the gene that determines ABO blood type. 
This gene encodes an enzyme that adds sugar molecules to lipids on the surface of red blood cells. These sugars act as recognition markers for the immune system. The gene that encodes the enzyme, designated Big I, has three common alleles, Big IB, whose product adds galactose, Big IA, whose product adds galactosamine, and little i, which codes for a protein that does not add a sugar. Different combinations of the three I gene alleles occur in different individuals because each person possesses two copies of the chromosome bearing the big I gene and may be homozygous for any allele or heterozygous for any two. An individual heterozygous for the big IA and big IB alleles produces both forms of the enzyme and adds both galactose and galactosamine to the surfaces of red blood cells. Because both alleles are expressed simultaneously in heterozygotes, the big IA and big IB alleles are codominant. Both big IA and big IB are dominant over the little i allele because both big IA or big IB alleles lead to sugar addition and the little i allele does not. The different combinations of the three alleles produce four different phenotypes, figure 13.24. 1. Type A individuals add only galactosamine. They are either big IA big IA homozygotes or big IA little i heterozygotes. 2. Type B individuals add only galactose. They are either big IB big IB homozygotes or big IB little i heterozygotes. 3. Type AB individuals add both sugars and are big IA big IB heterozygotes. 4. Type O individuals add neither sugar and are little i little i homozygotes. These four different cell surface phenotypes are called the ABO blood groups or, less commonly, the Landsteiner blood groups, after the man who first described them. As Landsteiner noted, a person's immune system can distinguish between these four phenotypes. If a type A individual receives a transfusion of type B blood, the recipient's immune system recognizes that the type B blood cells possess a foreign antigen, galactose, and attacks the donated blood cells, causing the cells to clump or agglutinate. This also happens if the donated blood is type AB. However, if the donated blood is type O, no immune attack will occur, as there are no galactose antigens on the surfaces of blood cells produced by the type O donor. In general, any individual's immune system will tolerate a transfusion of type O blood. Because neither galactose nor galactosamine is foreign to type AB individuals, whose red blood cells have both sugars, those individuals may receive any type of blood. The Rh blood group. Another set of cell surface markers on human red blood cells are the Rh blood group antigens, named for the rhesus monkey in which they were first described. About 85% of adult humans have the Rh cell surface marker on their red blood cells, and are called Rh positive. Rh negative persons lack this cell surface marker because they are homozygous for the recessive gene encoding it. If an Rh negative person is exposed to Rh positive blood, the Rh surface antigens of that blood are treated like foreign invaders by the Rh negative person's immune system, which proceeds to make antibodies directed against the Rh antigens. This most commonly happens when an Rh negative woman gives birth to an Rh positive child, whose father is Rh positive. At birth, some fetal red blood cells cross the placental barrier and enter the mother's bloodstream, where they induce the production of anti-RH antibodies. In subsequent pregnancies, the mother's antibodies can cross back to the new fetus and cause its red blood cells to clump, leading to a potentially fatal condition called erythroblastosis fetalis. Synopsis Many blood group genes possess multiple alleles, several of which may be common. Patterns of inheritance can be deduced from pedigrees. When a blood vessel ruptures, the blood in the immediate area of the rupture forms a solid gel called a clot. The clot forms as a result of the polymerization of protein fibers circulating in the blood. A dozen proteins are involved in this process, and all must function properly for a blood clot to form. A mutation causing any of these proteins to lose their activity leads to a form of hemophilia, a hereditary condition in which the blood is slow to clot or does not clot at all. Hemophilias are recessive disorders, expressed only when an individual does not possess any copy of the normal allele and so cannot produce one of the proteins necessary for clotting. 
most of the genes that encode the blood clotting proteins are on autosomes, but two, designated 8 and 9, are on the X chromosome. These two genes are sex-linked. Any male who inherits a mutant allele of either of the two genes will develop hemophilia because his other sex chromosome is a Y chromosome that lacks any alleles of those genes. The most famous instance of hemophilia, often called the royal hemophilia, is a sex-linked form that arose in one of the parents of Queen Victoria of England, 1819-1901, figure 13.25. In the five generations since Queen Victoria, ten of her male descendants have had hemophilia. The present British royal family has escaped the disorder because Queen Victoria's son, King Edward VII, did not inherit the defective allele, and all the subsequent rulers of England are his descendants. Three of Victoria's nine children did receive the defective allele, however, and they carried it by marriage into many of the other royal families of Europe, figure 13.26, where it is still being passed to future generations, except in Russia, where all of the five children of Victoria's granddaughter Alexandra were killed soon after the Russian Revolution in 1917. Speculation that one daughter, Anastasia, survived ended in 1999 when DNA analysis confirmed the identity of her remains. Synopsis Family pedigrees can reveal the mode of inheritance of a hereditary trait. Gene disorders can be due to simple alterations of proteins. Sickle cell anemia is a heritable disorder first noted in Chicago in 1904. Afflicted individuals have defective molecules of hemoglobin, the protein within red blood cells that carries oxygen. Consequently, these individuals are unable to properly transport oxygen to their tissues. The defective hemoglobin molecules stick to one another, forming stiff, rod-like structures and resulting in the formation of sickle-shaped red blood cells, figure 13.27. As a result of their stiffness and irregular shape, these cells have difficulty moving through the smallest blood vessels, they tend to accumulate in those vessels and form clots. People who have large proportions of sickle-shaped red blood cells tend to have intermittent illness and a shortened lifespan. The hemoglobin in the defective red blood cells differs from that in normal red blood cells in only one of hemoglobin's 574 amino acid subunits. In the defective hemoglobin, the amino acid valine replaces a glutamic acid at a single position in the protein. Interestingly, the position of the change is far from the active site of hemoglobin where the iron-bearing heme group binds oxygen. Instead, the change occurs on the outer edge of the protein. Why then is the result so catastrophic? The sickle cell mutation puts a very nonpolar amino acid on the surface of the hemoglobin protein, creating a sticky patch that sticks to other such patches, nonpolar amino acids tend to associate with one another in polar environments like water. As one hemoglobin adheres to another, ever longer chains of hemoglobin molecules form. Individuals heterozygous for the sickle cell allele are generally indistinguishable from normal persons. However, some of their red blood cells show the sickling characteristic when they are exposed to low levels of oxygen. The allele responsible for sickle cell anemia is particularly common among people of African descent, about 9% of African Americans are heterozygous for this allele, and about 0.2% are homozygous and therefore have the disorder. In some groups of people in Africa, up to 45% of all individuals are heterozygous for this allele, and 6% are homozygous. What factors determine the high frequency of sickle cell anemia in Africa? It turns out that heterozygosity for the sickle cell anemia allele increases resistance to malaria, a common and serious disease in Central Africa, figure 13.28. We will discuss this situation in detail in Chapter 21. Synopsis Sickle cell anemia is caused by a single nucleotide change in the gene for hemoglobin, producing a protein with a nonpolar amino acid on its surface that tends to make the molecules clump together. Some defects may soon be curable. Some of the most common and serious gene defects result from single recessive mutations, including many of the defects listed in Table 13.2. Recent developments in gene technology have raised the hope that this class of disorders may be curable. Perhaps the best example is cystic fibrosis, CF, 
the most common fatal genetic disorder among Caucasians. Cystic fibrosis is a fatal disease in which the body cells of affected individuals secrete a thick mucus that clogs the airways of the lungs. These same secretions block the ducts of the pancreas and liver so that the few patients who do not die of lung disease die of liver failure. There is no known cure. Cystic fibrosis results from a defect in a single gene, called CF, that is passed down from parent to child. One in 20 individuals possesses at least one copy of the defective gene. Most carriers are not afflicted with the disease, only those children who inherit a copy of the defective gene from each parent succumb to cystic fibrosis, about 1 in 2,500 infants. The function of the CF gene has proven difficult to study. In 1985 the first clear clue was obtained. An investigator, Paul Quinton, seized on a commonly observed characteristic of cystic fibrosis patients, that their sweat is abnormally salty, and performed the following experiment. He isolated a sweat duct from a small piece of skin and placed it in a solution of salt, NaCl, that was three times as concentrated as the NaCl inside the duct. He then monitored the movement of ions. Diffusion tends to drive both the sodium, Na+, and the chloride, Cl-, ions into the duct because of the higher outer ion concentrations. In skin isolated from normal individuals, a plus and Cl minus ions both entered the duct, as expected. In skin isolated from cystic fibrosis individuals, however, only Na plus ions entered the duct, no Cl minus ions entered. For the first time, the molecular nature of cystic fibrosis became clear. Cystic fibrosis is a defect in a plasma membrane protein called CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, that normally regulates passage of Cl- ions into and out of the body's cells. CFTR does not function properly in cystic fibrosis patients, see figure 4.8. The defective CF gene was isolated in 1987, and its position on a particular human chromosome, chromosome 7, was pinpointed in 1989. In 1990 a working CF gene was successfully transferred via adenovirus into human lung cells growing in tissue culture. The defective cells were cured, becoming able to transport chloride ions across their plasma membranes. Then in 1991, a team of researchers successfully transferred a normal human CF gene into the lung cells of a living animal, a rat. The CF gene was first inserted into a cold virus that easily infects lung cells, and the virus was inhaled by the rat. Carried piggyback, the CF gene entered the rat lung cells and began producing the normal human CFTR protein within these cells. Tests of gene transfer into CF patients were begun in 1993, and while a great deal of work remains to be done, the initial experiments were not successful, the future for cystic fibrosis patients for the first time seems bright. Synopsis Cystic fibrosis, and other genetic disorders, are potentially curable if ways can be found to successfully introduce normal alleles of the genes into affected individuals. Section 13.3 Genes are on chromosomes. Chromosomes, the vehicles of Mendelian inheritance. Chromosomes are not the only kinds of structures that segregate regularly when eukaryotic cells divide. Centrioles also divide and segregate in a regular fashion, as do the mitochondria and chloroplasts, when present, in the cytoplasm. Therefore, in the early 20th century it was by no means obvious that chromosomes were the vehicles of hereditary information. The Chromosomal Theory of Inheritance a central role for chromosomes in heredity was first suggested in 1900 by the German geneticist Karl Korins, in one of the papers announcing the rediscovery of Mendel's work. Soon after, observations that similar chromosomes paired with one another during meiosis led directly to the chromosomal theory of inheritance, first formulated by the American Walter Sutton in 1902. Several pieces of evidence supported Sutton's theory. One was that reproduction involves the initial union of only two cells, egg and sperm. If Mendel's model were correct, then these two gametes must make equal hereditary contributions. Sperm, however, 
contain little cytoplasm, suggesting that the hereditary material must reside within the nuclei of the gametes. Furthermore, while diploid individuals have two copies of each pair of homologous chromosomes, gametes have only one. This observation was consistent with Mendel's model, in which diploid individuals have two copies of each heritable gene and gametes have one. Finally, chromosomes segregate during meiosis, and each pair of homologues orients on the metaphase plate independently of every other pair. Segregation and independent assortment were two characteristics of the genes in Mendel's model. A problem with the chromosomal theory. However, investigators soon pointed out one problem with this theory. If Mendelian characters are determined by genes located on the chromosomes, and if the independent assortment of Mendelian traits reflects the independent assortment of chromosomes in meiosis, why does the number of characters that assort independently in a given kind of organism often greatly exceed the number of chromosome pairs the organism possesses? This seemed a fatal objection, and it led many early researchers to have serious reservations about Sutton's theory. Morgan's White-Eyed Fly the essential correctness of the chromosomal theory of heredity was demonstrated long before this paradox was resolved. A single small fly provided the proof. In 1910 Thomas Hunt Morgan, studying the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, detected a mutant male fly, one that differed strikingly from normal flies of the same species, its eyes were white instead of red, figure 13.29. Morgan immediately set out to determine if this new trait would be inherited in a Mendelian fashion. He first crossed the mutant male to a normal female to see if red or white eyes were dominant. All of the F1 progeny had red eyes, so Morgan concluded that red eye color was dominant over white. Following the experimental procedure at Mendel had established long ago, Morgan then crossed the red-eyed flies from the F1 generation with each other. Of the 4252F2 progeny Morgan examined, 782, 18%, had white eyes. Although the ratio of red eyes to white eyes in the F2 progeny was greater than 3 to 1, the results of the cross nevertheless provided clear evidence that eye color segregates. However, there was something about the outcome that was strange and totally unpredicted by Mendel's theory, all of the white-eyed F2 flies were males. How could this result be explained? Perhaps it was impossible for a white-eyed female fly to exist, such individuals might not be viable for some unknown reason. To test this idea, Morgan test-crossed the female F1 progeny with the original white-eyed male. He obtained both white-eyed and red-eyed males and females in a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, just as Mendelian theory predicted. Hence, a female could have white eyes. Why? Then, were there no white-eyed females among the progeny of the original cross? Sex Linkage The solution to this puzzle involved sex. In Drosophila, the sex of an individual is determined by the number of copies of a particular chromosome, the X chromosome, that an individual possesses. A fly with two X chromosomes is a female, and a fly with only one X chromosome is a male. In males, the single X chromosome pairs in meiosis with a dissimilar partner called the Y chromosome. The female thus produces only X gametes, while the male produces both X and Y gametes. When fertilization involves an X sperm, the result is an XX zygote, which develops into a female, when fertilization involves a Y sperm, the result is an XY zygote, which develops into a male. The solution to Morgan's puzzle is that the gene causing the white eye trait in Drosophila resides only on the X chromosome, it is absent from the Y chromosome. We now know that the Y chromosome in flies carries almost no functional genes. A trait determined by a gene on the X chromosome is said to be sex-linked. Knowing the white eye trait is recessive to the red eye trait, we can now see that Morgan's result was a natural consequence of the Mendelian assortment of chromosomes, figure 13.30. Morgan's experiment was one of the most important in the history of genetics because it presented the first clear evidence that the genes determining Mendelian traits do indeed reside on the chromosomes, as Sutton had proposed. The segregation of the white eye trait has a one-tune correspondence with the segregation of the X chromosome. 
In other words, Mendelian traits such as eye color in Drosophila assort independently because chromosomes do. When Mendel observed the segregation of alternative traits in pea plants, he was observing a reflection of the meiotic segregation of chromosomes. Synopsis Mendelian traits assort independently because they are determined by genes located on chromosomes that assort independently in meiosis. Genetic recombination Morgan's experiments led to the general acceptance of Sutton's chromosomal theory of inheritance. Scientists then attempted to resolve the paradox that there are many more independently assorting Mendelian genes than chromosomes. In 1903 the Dutch geneticist Hugo de Vries suggested that this paradox could be resolved only by assuming that homologous chromosomes exchange elements during meiosis. In 1909, French cytologist F. Janssens provided evidence to support this suggestion. Investigating chiasmata produced during amphibian meiosis, Janssens noticed that of the four chromatids involved in each chiasma, two crossed each other and two did not. He suggested that this crossing of chromatids reflected a switch in chromosomal arms between the paternal and maternal homologues, involving one chromatid in each homologue. His suggestion was not accepted widely, primarily because it was difficult to see how two chromatids could break and rejoin at exactly the same position. Crossing over. Later experiments clearly established that Janssen's was indeed correct. One of these experiments, performed in 1931 by American geneticist Kurt Stern, is described in Figure 13.31. Stern studied two sex-linked eye characters in Drosophila strains whose X chromosomes were visibly abnormal at both ends. He first examined many flies and identified those in which an exchange had occurred with respect to the two eye characters. He then studied the chromosomes of those flies to see if their X chromosomes had exchanged arms. Stern found that all of the individuals that had exchanged eye traits also possessed chromosomes that had exchanged abnormal ends. The conclusion was inescapable, genetic exchanges of characters such as eye color involved the physical exchange of chromosome arms, a phenomenon called crossing over. Crossing over creates new combinations of genes, and is thus a form of genetic recombination. The chromosomal exchanges Stern demonstrated provide the solution to the paradox, because crossing over can occur between homologues anywhere along the length of the chromosome, in locations that seem to be randomly determined. Thus, if two different genes are located relatively far apart on a chromosome, crossing over is more likely to occur somewhere between them than if they are located close together. Two genes can be on the same chromosome and still show independent assortment if they are located so far apart on the chromosome that crossing over occurs regularly between them, figure 13.32. Using recombination to make genetic maps. Because crossing over is more frequent between two genes that are relatively far apart than between two that are close together, the frequency of crossing over can be used to map the relative positions of genes on chromosomes. In a cross, the proportion of progeny exhibiting an exchange between two genes is a measure of the frequency of crossover events between them, and thus indicates the relative distance separating them. The results of such crosses can be used to construct a genetic map that measures distance between genes in terms of the frequency of recombination. One map unit is defined as the distance within which a crossover event is expected to occur in an average of 1% of gametes. A map unit is now called a centimorgan, after Thomas Hunt Morgan. In recent times new technologies have allowed geneticists to create gene maps based on the relative positions of specific gene sequences called restriction sites because they are recognized by DNA cleaving enzymes called restriction endonucleases. Restriction maps, discussed in Chapter 19, have largely supplanted genetic recombination maps for detailed gene analysis because they are far easier to produce. Recombination maps remain the method of choice for genes widely separated on a chromosome. The three-point cross. In constructing a genetic map, one simultaneously monitors recombination among three or more genes located on the same chromosome, referred to as syntenic genes. When genes are close enough together on a chromosome that they do not assort independently, they are said to be linked to one another. A cross involving three linked genes is called a three-point cross. 
Data obtained by Morgan on traits encoded by genes on the X chromosome of Drosophila were used by his student A. H. Sturdivant to draw the first genetic map, figure 13.33. By convention, the most common allele of a gene is often denoted with the symbol plus and is designated as wild type. All other alleles are denoted with just the specific letters. Analyzing a three-point cross. The first genetic map was constructed by A. H. Sturdivant, a student of Morgan's in 1913. He studied several traits of Drosophila, all of which exhibited sex linkage and thus were encoded by genes residing on the same chromosome, the X chromosome. Here we will describe his study of three traits, Y, yellow body color, the normal body color is gray, W, white eye color, the normal eye color is red, and M, miniature wing the normal wing is 50% longer. Sturtevant carried out the mapping cross by crossing a female fly homozygous for the three recessive alleles with a normal male fly that carried none of them. All of the progeny were heterozygotes. Such a cross is conventionally represented by a diagram like the one that follows, in which the lines represent gene locations and plus indicates the normal, or wild-type, allele. Each female fly participating in a cross possesses two homologous copies of the chromosome being mapped, and both chromosomes are represented in the diagram. Crossing over occurs between these two copies in meiosis. In the P generation, a YWM mutant homozygotic female crossed with a wild type male produces. In the F1 generation, a heterozygotic female. These heterozygous females, the F1 generation, are the key to the mapping procedure. Because they are heterozygous, any crossing over that occurs during meiosis will, if it occurs between where these genes are located, produce gametes with different combinations of alleles for these genes, in other words, recombinant chromosomes. Thus, a crossover between the homologous X chromosomes of such a female in the interval between the Y and W genes will yield recombinant. YW plus, and Y plus W, chromosomes, which are different combinations than we started with. In the diagram below, the crossed lines between the chromosomes indicate where the crossover occurs. In the parental chromosomes of this cross, W is always linked with Y and Y plus linked with W plus dot. In order to see all the recombinant types that might be present among the gametes of these heterozygous flies, Sturtevant conducted a test cross. He crossed female heterozygous flies to males recessive for all three traits and examined the progeny. Because males contribute either a Y chromosome with no genes on it or an X chromosome with recessive alleles at all three loci, the male contribution does not disguise the potentially recombinant female chromosomes. Table 13.3 summarizes the results Sturtevant obtained. The parentals are represented by the highest number of progeny and the double crossovers progeny in which two crossovers occurred, by the lowest number. To analyze his data, Sturtevant considered the traits in pairs and determined which involved a crossover event. 1. For the body trait, Y, and the I trait, W, the first two classes, Y plus W plus, and, Y W, involve no crossovers, they are parental combinations. In Table 13.3, no progeny numbers are tabulated for these two classes on the body I column, a dash appears instead. 2. The next two classes have the same body I combination as the parents, Y plus W plus, and YW, so again no numbers are entered as recombinants under body I crossover type. 3. The next two classes, Y plus W, and YW plus, do not have the same body I combinations as the parent chromosomes, so the observed numbers of progeny are recorded, 16 and 12, respectively. 4. The last two classes also differ from parental chromosomes in body I combination, so again the observed numbers of each class are recorded, 1 and 0. 5. The sum of the numbers of observed progeny that are recombinant for body, Y, and I, W is 16 plus 12 plus 1, or 29. Because the total number of progeny is 2205, this represents 29 slash 2205, or 0 0.01315.
the percentage of recombination between Y and W is thus 1.315%, or 1.3 centimorgans. To estimate the percentage of recombination between I, W, and wing, M, one proceeds in the same manner, obtaining a value of 32.608%, or 32.6 centimorgans. Similarly, body, Y, and wing, M, are separated by a recombination distance of 33.832%, or 33.8 centimorgans. From this, then, we can construct our genetic map. The biggest distance, 33.8 centimorgans, separates the two outside genes, which are evidently Y and M. The gene W is between them, near Y. Y and W are separated by 1.3 centimorgans while Y and M are separated by 33.8 centimorgans. The two distances 1.3 and 32.6 do not add up to 33.8 but rather to 33.9. The difference, 0.1, represents chromosomes in which two crossovers occurred, one between Y and W and another between W and M. These chromosomes do not exhibit recombination between Y and M. Genetic maps such as this are key tools in genetic analysis, permitting an investigator reliably to predict how a newly discovered trait, once it has been located on the chromosome map, will recombine with many others. The Human Genetic Map Genetic maps of human chromosomes, figure 13.34, are of great importance. Knowing where particular genes are located on human chromosomes can often be used to tell whether a fetus at risk of inheriting a genetic disorder actually has the disorder. The genetic engineering techniques described in Chapter 19 have begun to permit investigators to isolate specific genes and determine their nucleotide sequences. It is hoped that knowledge of differences at the gene level may suggest successful therapies for particular genetic disorders and that knowledge of a gene's location on a chromosome will soon permit the substitution of normal alleles for dysfunctional ones. Because of the great potential of this approach, investigators are working hard to assemble a detailed map of the entire human genome, the Human Genome Project, described in Chapter 19. Initially, this map will consist of a library of thousands of small fragments of DNA whose relative positions are known. Investigators wishing to study a particular gene will first use techniques described in Chapter 19 to screen this library and determine which fragment carries the gene of interest. They will then be able to analyze that fragment in detail. In parallel with this mammoth undertaking, the other, Smaller genomes have already been sequenced, including those of yeasts and several bacteria. Progress on the human genome is rapid, and the full map is expected within the next 10 years. A note from the New Biology. The sixth edition of this textbook was published in 2001. Since then, progress in molecular genetics has been tremendous. Please consult more recent publications for the latest findings in this field. Synopsis. Gene maps locate the relative positions of different genes on the chromosomes of an organism. Traditionally produced by analyzing the relative amounts of recombination in genetic crosses, gene maps are increasingly being made by analyzing the sizes of fragments made by restriction enzymes. Human chromosomes Each human somatic cell normally has 46 chromosomes, which in meiosis form 23 pairs. By convention, the chromosomes are divided into seven groups, designated A through G, each characterized by a different size, shape, and appearance. The differences among the chromosomes are most clearly visible when the chromosomes are arranged in order in a karyotype, figure 13.35. Techniques that stain individual segments of chromosomes with different colored dyes make the identification of chromosomes unambiguous. Like a fingerprint, each chromosome always exhibits the same pattern of colored bands. Human sex chromosomes Of the 23 pairs of human chromosomes, 22 are perfectly matched in both males and females and are called autosomes. The remaining pair, the sex chromosomes, consist of two similar chromosomes in females and two dissimilar chromosomes in males. In humans, females are designated XX and males XY. One of the sex chromosomes in the male, the Y chromosome, is highly condensed and bears few functional genes. 
Because few genes on the Y chromosome are expressed, recessive alleles on a male's single X chromosome have no active counterpart on the Y chromosome. Some of the active genes the Y chromosome does possess are responsible for the features associated with maleness in humans. Consequently, any individual with at least one Y chromosome is a male. Sex chromosomes in other organisms The structure and number of sex chromosomes vary in different organisms, Table 13.4. In the fruit fly Drosophila, females are XX and males XY, as in humans and most other vertebrates. However, in birds, the male has two Z chromosomes, and the female has a Z and a W chromosome. In some insects, such as grasshoppers, there is no Y chromosome, females are XX and males are characterized as XO, the O indicates the absence of a chromosome. Sex determination. In humans a specific gene located on the Y chromosome known as SRY plays a key role in development of male sexual characteristics. This gene is expressed early in development, and acts to masculinize genitalia and secondary sexual organs that would otherwise be female. Lacking a Y chromosome, females fail to undergo these changes. Among fishes and in some species of reptiles, environmental changes can cause changes in the expression of this sex-determining gene, and thus of the sex of the adult individual. Bar bodies Although males have only one copy of the X chromosome and females have two, female cells do not produce twice as much of the proteins encoded by genes on the X chromosome. Instead, one of the X chromosomes in females is inactivated early in embryonic development, shortly after the embryo's sex is determined. Which X chromosome is inactivated varies randomly from cell to cell. If a woman is heterozygous for a sex-linked trait, some of her cells will express one allele and some the other. The inactivated and highly condensed X chromosome is visible as a darkly staining bar body attached to the nuclear membrane, figure 13.36. X inactivation is not restricted to humans. The patches of color on tortoise shell and calico cats are a familiar result of this process. The gene for orange coat color is located on the X chromosome. The O allele specifies orange fur, and the O allele specifies black fur. Early in development, one X chromosome is inactivated in the cells that will become skin cells. If the remaining active X carries the O allele, then the patch of skin that results from that cell will have orange fur. If it carries the O allele, then the fur will be black. Because X inactivation is a random process, the orange and black patches appear randomly in the cat's coat. Because only females have two copies of the X chromosome, only they can be heterozygous at the O gene, so almost all calico cats are females, figure 13.37. The exception is male cats that have the genotype XXY, the XXY genotype is discussed in the next section. The white on a calico cat is due to the action of an allele at another gene, the white spotting gene. Synopsis one of the 23 pairs of human chromosomes carries the genes that determine sex. The gene determining maleness is located on a version of the sex chromosome called Y, which has few other transcribed genes. Human abnormalities due to alterations in chromosome number. Occasionally, homologs or sister chromatids fail to separate properly in meiosis, leading to the acquisition or loss of a chromosome in a gamete. This condition, called primary non-disjunction, can result in individuals with severe abnormalities if the affected gamete forms a zygote. Non-disjunction involving autosomes. Almost all humans of the same sex have the same karyotype, for the same reason that all automobiles have engines, transmissions, and wheels, other arrangements don't work well. Humans who have lost even one copy of an autosome, called monosomics, do not survive development. In all but a few cases, humans who have gained an extra autosome, called trisomics, also do not survive. However, five of the smallest autosomes, those numbered 13, 15, 18, 21, and 22, can be present in humans as three copies and still allow the individual to survive for a time.
the presence of an extra chromosome 13, 15, or 18 causes severe developmental defects, and infants with such a genetic makeup die within a few months. Down syndrome. The developmental defect produced by trisomy 21, figure 13.38, was first described in 1866 by J. Langdon Down, for this reason, it is called Down syndrome, formerly Down syndrome. About one in every 750 children exhibits Down syndrome, and the frequency is similar in all racial groups. Similar conditions also occur in chimpanzees and other related primates. In humans, the defect is associated with a particular small portion of chromosome 21. When this chromosomal segment is present in three copies instead of two, Down syndrome results. In 97% of the human cases examined, all of chromosome 21 is present in three copies. In the other 3%, a small portion of chromosome 21 containing the critical segment has been added to another chromosome by a process called translocation, see chapter 18, it exists along with the normal two copies of chromosome 21. This condition is known as translocation down syndrome. Not much is known about the developmental role of the genes whose extra copies produces Down syndrome, although clues are beginning to emerge from current research. Some researchers suspect that the gene or genes that produce Down syndrome are similar or identical to some of the genes associated with cancer and with Alzheimer's disease. The reason for this suspicion is that one of the human cancer-causing genes, to be described in Chapter 18, and the gene causing Alzheimer's disease are located on the segment of chromosome 21 associated with Down syndrome. Moreover, cancer is more common in children with Down syndrome. The incidence of leukemia, for example, is 11 times higher in children with Down syndrome than in unaffected children of the same age. How does Down syndrome arise? In humans, it comes about almost exclusively as a result of primary non-disjunction of chromosome 21 during egg formation. The cause of these primary non-disjunctions is not known, but their incidence, like that of cancer, increases with age, figure 13.39. In mothers younger than 20 years of age, the risk of giving birth to a child with Down syndrome is about 1 in 1700, in mothers 20 to 30 years old, the risk is only about 1 in 1400. In mothers 30 to 35 years old, however, the risk rises to 1 in 750, and by age 45, the risk is as high as 1 in 16. Primary non-disjunctions are far more common in women than in men because all of the eggs a woman will ever produce have developed to the point of prophase in meiosis 1 by the time she is born. By the time she has children, her eggs are as old as she is. In contrast, men produce new sperm daily. Therefore, there is a much greater chance for problems of various kinds, including those that cause primary non-disjunction, to accumulate over time in the gametes of women than in those of men. For this reason, the age of the mother is more critical than that of the father in couples contemplating childbearing. Non-disjunction involving the sex chromosomes Individuals that gain or lose a sex chromosome do not generally experience the severe developmental abnormalities caused by similar changes in autosomes. Such individuals may reach maturity, but they have somewhat abnormal features. The X chromosome. When X chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis, some of the gametes that are produced possess both X chromosomes and so are XX gametes. The other gametes that result from such an event have no sex chromosome and are designated O, figure 13.40. If an XX gamete combines with an X gamete, the resulting triple X zygote develops into a female with one functional X chromosome and two bar bodies. She is sterile but usually normal in other respects. If an XX gamete instead combines with a Y gamete, the effects are more serious. The resulting XXY zygote develops into a sterile male who has many female body characteristics and, in some cases, diminished mental capacity. This condition, called Klinefelter syndrome, occurs in about 1 out of every 500 male births. If an O gamete fuses with a Y gamete, the resulting OY zygote is non-viable and fails to develop further because humans cannot survive when they lack the genes on the X chromosome. 
If, on the other hand, an O gamete fuses with an X gamete, the exozygote develops into a sterile female of short stature, with a webbed neck and immature sex organs that do not undergo changes during puberty. The mental abilities of an exo individual are in the low normal range. This condition, called Turner syndrome, occurs roughly once in every 5,000 female births. The Y chromosome. The Y chromosome can also fail to separate in meiosis, leading to the formation of YY gametes. When these gametes combine with X gametes, the XYY zygotes develop into fertile males of normal appearance. The frequency of the XYY genotype, Jacob syndrome, is about 1 per 1,000 newborn males, but it is approximately 20 times higher among males in penal and mental institutions. This observation has led to the highly controversial suggestion that XYY males are inherently antisocial, a suggestion supported by some studies but not by others. In any case, most XYY males do not develop patterns of antisocial behavior. Synopsis Gene dosage plays a crucial role in development, so humans do not tolerate the loss or addition of chromosomes well. Autosome loss is always lethal, and an extra autosome is with few exceptions lethal too. Additional sex chromosomes have less serious consequences, although they can lead to sterility. Genetic counseling Although most genetic disorders cannot yet be cured, we are learning a great deal about them, and progress toward successful therapy is being made in many cases. In the absence of a cure, however, the only recourse is to try to avoid producing children with these conditions. The process of identifying parents at risk of producing children with genetic defects and of assessing the genetic state of early embryos is called genetic counseling. If a genetic defect is caused by a recessive allele, how can potential parents determine the likelihood that they carry the allele? One way is through pedigree analysis, often employed as an aid in genetic counseling. By analyzing a person's pedigree, it is sometimes possible to estimate the likelihood that the person is a carrier for certain disorders. For example, if one of your relatives has been afflicted with a recessive genetic disorder such as cystic fibrosis, it is possible that you are a heterozygous carrier of the recessive allele for that disorder. When a couple is expecting a child, and pedigree analysis indicates that both of them have a significant probability of being heterozygous carriers of a recessive allele responsible for a serious genetic disorder, the pregnancy is said to be a high-risk pregnancy. In such cases, there is a significant probability that the child will exhibit the clinical disorder. Another class of high-risk pregnancies is that in which the mothers are more than 35 years old. As we have seen, the frequency of birth of infants with Down syndrome increases dramatically in the pregnancies of older women, see figure 13.39. When a pregnancy is diagnosed as being high-risk, many women elect to undergo amniocentesis, a procedure that permits the prenatal diagnosis of many genetic disorders. In the fourth month of pregnancy, a sterile hypodermic needle is inserted into the expanded uterus of the mother, removing a small sample of the amniotic fluid bathing the fetus, figure 13.41. Within the fluid are free-floating cells derived from the fetus, once removed, these cells can be grown in cultures in the laboratory. During amniocentesis, the position of the needle and that of the fetus are usually observed by means of ultrasound. The sound waves used in ultrasound are not harmful to mother or fetus, and they permit the person withdrawing the amniotic fluid to do so without damaging the fetus. In addition, ultrasound can be used to examine the fetus for signs of major abnormalities. In recent years, physicians have increasingly turned to a new, less invasive procedure for genetic screening called chorionic villi sampling. In this procedure, the physician removes cells from the chorion, a membranous part of the placenta that nourishes the fetus. This procedure can be used earlier in pregnancy, by the eighth week, and yields results much more rapidly than does amniocentesis. To test for certain genetic disorders, genetic counselors can look for three things in the cultures of cells obtained from amniocentesis or chorionic villi sampling. First, analysis of the karyotype can reveal aneuploidy, extra or missing chromosomes, and gross chromosomal alterations. Second, 
In many cases it is possible to test directly for the proper functioning of enzymes involved in genetic disorders. The lack of normal enzymatic activity signals the presence of the disorder. Thus, the lack of the enzyme responsible for breaking down phenylalanine signals PKU, phenylketonuria, the absence of the enzyme responsible for the breakdown of gangliosides indicates Tay-Sachs disease, and so forth. Third, genetic counselors can look for an association with known genetic markers. For sickle cell anemia, Huntington's disease, and one form of muscular dystrophy, a genetic disorder characterized by weakened muscles, investigators have found other mutations on the same chromosomes that, by chance, occur at about the same place as the mutations that cause those disorders. By testing for the presence of these other mutations, a genetic counselor can identify individuals with a high probability of possessing the disorder-causing mutations. Finding such mutations in the first place is a little like searching for a needle in a haystack, but persistent efforts have proved successful in these three disorders. The associated mutations are detectable because they alter the length of the DNA segments that restriction enzymes produce when they cut strands of DNA at particular places, see chapter 18. Therefore, these mutations produce what are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RFLPs, figure 13.42. Synopsis Many gene defects can be detected early in pregnancy, allowing for appropriate planning by the prospective parents.